Hello everyone. My name is Jen Nolan. I am the Programs Manager at Musculoskeletal Australia and I would like to warmly welcome you to our webinar on the topic of psoriatic arthritis this evening. In line with Musculoskeletal Australia's focus on empowering consumers through education and support services, we are offering a series of webinars for a consumer audience during 2019. Our list of webinars should be on your screens now. Musculoskeletal Australia is also very grateful to UCB Australia for providing sponsorship for this evening's webinar. Our presenter for this evening is Dr Marie Falatar. Marie is a clinical rheumatologist working in private practice in Melbourne with a special interest in psoriatic arthritis. Her postgraduate training included a fellowship program with the University of Toronto, Canada in 2002-2003 in psoriatic arthritis and lupus. Dr. Falatar has continued with involvement in therapeutic clinical trials and conducted investigated initiated research in psoriatic arthritis in the areas of imaging, genetics and clinical studies. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Marie. Thanks very much, Marie. Okay, good evening everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. So um, as Jen has said, um, I'll be, I have a series of slides which aren't going to take the whole hour because I am trying to leave lots of time for questions and rather than listening to me for 30 or 40 minutes straight, it's probably more interesting for you to ask some questions along the way. So I will address those questions along the way unless we're inundated with lots and lots and so then I'll just um, make a judgement and move on and leave some till the end. So always more interesting with audience participation. So um, I'm just a Melbourne girl, uh, did my rheumatology training, went to Canada, um, have done various things, disclosures are mandatory, so I've done various things for pharmaceutical companies. Um, tonight's talk is just for um, uh, Musculoskeletal Health Australia, Arthritis Australia. So um, in, to outline what I'm going to discuss, um, it will be uh, just to go over, I've been asked to talk about psoriatic arthritis, but I'll just try, I'll try and illustrate where that fits in to other types of arthritis, particularly osteoarthritis, which is so common. Um, what, what are the clinical features of psoriatic arthritis treatments and um, of course questions. So um, where does psoriatic arthritis fit in? So often when uh, patients come to someone like me, there, um, they mostly fall into this category, these two categories of osteoarthritis and inflammation in the joint, and they're really, they're really quite different. So I thought I'd go through some of those things. Um, in the inflammatory arthritis category, there's things like psoriatic arthritis, which is fairly common. Um, common means for us that three percent of the population suffers from the skin rash, psoriasis approximately, and of those 3%, about a third will develop um, an inflammatory arthritis, inflamed joints in association with that. Rheumatoid arthritis is, another, is the other common one that we see. Lupus is, not, is less common. Ankylosing spondylitis tends to be uh, generally younger men in their 20s, often with prominent um, back stiffness and soreness. So these are some pictures to um, show you um, what, uh, so what a normal joint looks like. So in this normal joint we have bone, bone and cartilage in between which most of us know as the cushion in the joint and the cartilage is illustrated by that blue line. Also what um, people might not know is that there is a membrane wrapped around each joint and so that membrane is called synovium and it produces a bit of lubricant fluid, a bit like grease and oil. Now in a condition like inflammatory arthritis, um, that membrane starts to become inflamed and uh, because it's red, sore and swollen there, it produces extra fluid, so hence the pink, pinkish area. Um, and that causes lots of pain and stiffness, the, such as in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. Osteoarthritis, which is the common age-related thing, uh, arthritis which we all get, it is universal, uh, we all get it in our spine, um, knees typically, um, many other joints in the body. In that condition, the cartilage, the cushion between the joints wears thin. So 
So in this picture, that blue line is, is very much dimmed. I often say to pe people it's like a couch cushion that's gone flat or like a tyre that's gone flat. And it doesn't go flat overnight, but typically it develops like potholes in the road. And those potholes get bigger and bigger and bigger in life slowly year by year. And sometimes, not always, we end up with bone on bone arthritis. So there can be a bit of inflammation with osteoarthritis, um, but mostly the inflammation is uh, with conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. So briefly on osteoarthritis, um, typically people start to complain in our 40s um, onwards, um, can be younger depending on what injuries one has had. Um, and men and women are fairly equally affected. And there are some joints where it typically occurs. Um, and previously injured joints is one of those. So the knee is a very good example where um, almost everybody with time develops some cartilage wear and tear and thinning of that blue cushion. Don't forget to put in questions if you like. So um, the, uh, apart from the knees, it often occurs in the fingers and especially in the lower half of the body because the lower half of the body carries us around. Um, so our back, knees, feet, hips, um, they suffer from wear and tear typically. So this is an x-ray of what a knee looks like once it becomes affected quite badly by osteoarthritis. So um, this is a fairly normal x-ray of a knee. Um, so that's the femur, the thigh bone, the tibia, the shin bone. And in an x-ray we see, we get an idea of, oh, we get an idea of how much cushion there is between how much of the cartilage is left by how much space is between um, uh, the, the bones. So where there's pretty good space, you know that there's pretty good cartilage sitting there separating those bones. Um, in this, kind, this x-ray really shows very severe osteoarthritis where you've lost a lot of that space. Um, I've been asked a question, can inflammatory arthritis promote the development of osteoarthritis? And that's a very good question. The answer is yes. And that's because when, um, when a joint gets damaged, if, if especially if a joint is damaged by the inflammatory process, then often that cartilage loss tends to be accelerated. Fortunately, much of the time now when we treat people with inflammatory arthritis, most people don't get any joint damage at all. And so where there's no joint damage, you don't necessarily develop more osteoarthritis in that joint. Um, so, and I've been asked in the knee joint, for example, do we know what happens to the menisci? So, very good question. Perhaps you've had some personal experience with that. The meniscus is also a rim of tissue which um, sits around the cartilage, a bit like lace around a dress. And much like the cartilage shows some wear and tear, also the meniscus shows some wear and tear. The, my illustrative examples of that to people are often that it's a bit like a frayed t-shirt, it just slowly frays in the course of life or like the potholes in the road. Um, can, can arthritis be inherited from family? Um, yes, so just specifically depending on what type of arthritis you're talking about. Osteoarthritis, there is a little bit of inheritance going on. In psoriatic arthritis, um, there's more inheritance going on. So just to finish off, um, to compare and contrast steroidic arthritis to osteoarthritis, this is a picture of the hands because this is a very common situation where um, we develop osteoarthritis in the hands um, and it's typically in these joints and these joints. Um, whereas rheumatoid, for example, and steroidic arthritis are commonly affecting these knuckles here and the wrist. We don't tend to see much osteoarthritis in those joints and these joints. So if someone comes into our office and says, you know, I've got a lot of stiffness and pain in my hands and we work out which joints are tender, which are the ones that are bugging them, this kind of appearance with a knobbly bony bit, that's very typical of osteoarthritis. Unfortunately, it gets confusing when somebody that already has rheumatoid and osteoarthritis, sorry, rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis, some, a condition that's inflammatory, then comes comes along in their 40s and 50s that also develops osteoarthritis. So unfortunately, this can happen as well on top of those conditions. And we don't have drugs that prevent this process. We don't have any proven treatment to prevent cartilage wear and tear. Okay, so this is um, just pictures good. So this is progression of osteoarthritis in a person 
where the joint space progressively disappears. So not much space between the bones there. Okay, so getting back to inflammatory arthritis then. Um, so what is psoriatic arthritis? So psoriatic arthritis is in the category of an inflammatory process. It's autoimmune. We know for a fact that the immune system starts to launch an attack in various aspects of the body. So um, it can be wrists, it can be knuckles, it can be shoulders, it can be the spine. So rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, doesn't tend to affect the spine except for the neck. Um, but psoriatic arthritis can affect the whole spine. And psoriatic arthritis can affect um, all the joints in the legs as well. And it tends to um, develop mostly in, okay, well, um, in people who already have psoriasis. Um, so the um, psoriatic arthritis tends to affect men and women equally, whereas with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, women are affected a little bit more than men in a ratio of something like three to two, women in favour of men. Um, inflammatory arthritis can also affect children and people of all ages. So you can be 10 years old and develop inflamed joints. You can be 80 years old and develop inflamed joints from these autoimmune um, processes. Um, but fortunately with treatments, um, most people who have inflammatory arthritis show no visible signs of their disease. Now psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis um, I find very interesting. It can affect many parts of the body. So psoriasis is a skin rash and I have quite a few slides of, of psoriasis skin rash. Very commonly it's in the scalp, very commonly the hairdresser might comment on it. It's the sort of rash that sometimes can be relatively small on the elbows or knees, usually on the outside of um, elbows or knees. Um, and often people might not bother to go to the doctor about it. Um, they just know it's an itchy, irritant area. It might get better sometimes, worse than others. We know it tends to improve with sunlight. Um, it can affect the nails. So people with psoriasis can get these funny nail changes. Um, there are quite a few I'll show you in slides. And it, it can affect joints, tendon inflammation. So um, this is a picture of somebody with a swollen Achilles tendon. And uh, this is an MRI of somebody's low back where this is a joint in the buttock called the sacroiliac joint and that white area is an area that's inflamed. The sort of symptoms this person might um, describe would be profound stiffness and soreness when they get up in the morning this kind of inflammation might even wake them from sleep. Whereas typically as you and I get older and we get a bad back, we might feel a little bit stiff in the morning but not too bad, but then get pretty sore and stiff later in the day. The more we do, the more we hurt. Inflammation typically causes pain when, um, when you're not doing anything. So lack of movement is, um, causes issues. So sleep is a long period of lack of movement. So people wake up really, really stiff and sore. People often come to us and say, I don't know what's going on, but in the last few months I suddenly feel like I've aged. I'm profoundly stiff and sore when I get up in the morning. So with regard to the question, do you need to display a rash to be diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis? Um, the short answer is no. Um, so we diagnose somebody with psoriatic arthritis um, if they've had a history of psoriasis and they have turned up with inflamed joints. So you don't have to have psoriasis at the time to be diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. Um, the, sometimes people have inflamed joints without any history of psoriasis and about 15% of people develop psoriasis down the track. So they develop the inflamed joints first and then the skin rash second. Usually it's the psoriasis first and then the arthritis second. About 80 to 85% develop the psoriasis first. And often people have had psoriasis, they tell us, for about 10 years before they developed inflamed joints. Occasionally it happens at the same time. You don't have to have severe psoriasis for us to diagnose psoriatic arthritis. So people get confused about that. So well, how can I have such bad joint inflammation but my skin is really nothing at all? But it really often happens that way. Um, if there is a family history, some, a, a person might come in whose mother or father has psoriasis. Um, it is psoriasis very strongly inherited, particularly through the father's side. So just having a parent with psoriasis and if you've turned up with inflamed joints, then you're very likely to fit into this psoriatic arthritis category. So don't be surprised 
if we um, diagnose psoriatic arthritis that way. That's generally provided you don't have the rheumatoid antibodies. So um, psoriasis, 3% of the adult population, predominantly Caucasians, um, mostly it precedes the arthritis by um, 10 years. Um, and occasionally they appear simultaneously, and the common age of onset is 40 to 60. Now, um, I might just progress. Um, okay, so here are some pictures of psoriasis. So this is, um, psoriasis is very typically red, scaly, itchy. Some people have more redness than scaliness, some people have more scaliness than redness, um, but it is very commonly itchy. Um, this is a person who has turned up with um, a little bit, bit of psoriasis and pain and swelling in their hands. And those joints across there are swollen and that nail looks abnormal, which is a common abnormality um, in, um, in psoriatic arthritis. So just to contrast, um, us middle-aged people develop osteoarthritis that looks a bit like this, knobbly bony bits affecting those joints and these joints. In the fingers, psoriatic arthritis or inflamed joints looks more like this. People turn up and they have swelling in the wrist, swelling across the knuckles and these joints. Um, has there been an increase over recent years? Um, I actually can't say because it's very hard to get clear statistics in the community of how common psoriatic arthritis is. Um, we certainly know it's a bit more recognised. We know that it's had more research interest, partly because now we have such effective drugs. But um, to get a really good estimate of prevalence, you'd have to stand on a street corner for days and days and days and survey everybody that comes past and analyse their joints. So it is technically, unfortunately, difficult to work out um, prevalence in the community. Um, does so we often um, shorthand psoriatic arthritis as um, PSA um, and uh, um, so this is an example of um, other swollen joints. So rheumatoid arthritis, um, you know, when you ask a doctor, well, how do you know well, whether I've got rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis, it's partly based on the history of psoriasis, but sometimes patients have had it and they don't know they've had it. Sometimes it's the way which joints are inflamed and in what pattern. So the pattern of joint inflammation makes a difference. Somebody that turns up with this is very unlikely to have rheumatoid. So this is one phenomenally swollen joint. We tend to call that colloquially a sausage finger. Um, medically it's termed dactylitis, but in other words where there's one finger really predominantly severely inflamed. Rheumatoid in contrast tends to be quite symmetrical. It's often both wrists, both fingers, both, um, both sides of the hands and feet. Um, but psoriatic arthritis may be a bit like this, but it also may be just a joint here and there. It might be an elbow, a knee, and a couple of fingers that are inflamed. So when we see that kind of thing, we think, hmm, more likely to be something like psoriatic arthritis than rheumatoid. So this is a person with another sausage digit, and so that's that sausage. So compared to that skinny second toe on the left, they've got a very chubby second toe, and that's a very swollen joint. This big toe is also a very swollen joint. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis symmetrical, psoriatic arthritis asymmetrical. So someone with a very affected right hand, not so affected left hand. Rarely see that in rheumatoid, it tends to be both sides. So more pictures of swollen joints. So third toe very swollen there, second toe and fourth toe very swollen, that toe terribly, terribly swollen. Will reactive arthritis increase the likelihood of psoriatic arthritis? So um, the uh, the short answer is no or maybe, but um, they both, reactive arthritis is what we call an inflammatory arthritis that occurs after an infection. Um, and it may behave and look just like psoriatic arthritis where you get these very small and chubby fingers or toes. Um, and it can be very asymmetrical, can affect the spine, um, may or may not disappear on its own in a few months or a year. Um, technically doesn't increase the likelihood of you developing psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. So, but, it, but it certainly can look the same when it comes to the swollen joint process. So pictures of psoriasis. So it can look like this in the knees and that in the elbows. It can be very nasty and there are some people who really suffer 
with um, really severe psoriasis throughout their body. Uh, as you can imagine, this um, is um, very uncomfortable. And it can do things to your nails. So don't be surprised if a rheumatologist looks at the nails, because seeing these little, um, um, what we call nail pits, which are like little divots in the nails, it's very typical of psoriasis affecting the nails. And uh, the lifting up of the nails there is called onycholysis. That's very common with psoriasis. So different um, images of how um, psoriasis can look in terms of redness or scaliness. Now, I'll just go back to, I had a slide back here. Um, now, the, the interesting thing, we, we often discuss um, weight management with osteoarthritis, where there's wear and tear. But there, um, we don't have that much information about weight and autoimmune diseases. And psoriatic arthritis is an autoimmune disease. But um, when it comes to psoriatic arthritis, we do have quite a bit of data on weight. And that's because it has become clearly recognised that in general, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis patients tend to be in general a bit heavier than rheumatoid arthritis patients. And we, it's now a bit more understood that carrying extra body weight, which means extra fat cells, those fat cells are not just stores of energy, they actually are immune active. They produce um, chemical signals to the body which increase the inflammation. So um, at a clinic in North America where they have hundreds and hundreds of psoriasis patients, um, they noted that um, um, they looked at patients with psoriasis to see which ones were more likely to develop psoriatic arthritis. And basically they noticed that those who particularly gained a lot of weight over time were much more likely to develop inflamed joints. Now this is not something that's recognised with rheumatoid arthritis. So body mass index um, is BMI. And so they looked at psoriasis patients at age 18. And those even that were a bit heavier than um, is ideal, at the age of 18, they, that was a predictor for um, being more likely to develop um, psoriatic arthritis later on. Um, <clears throat> question, um, um, is massage contraindicated um, directly? In other words, are you not allowed to have massage? No, you are certainly allowed to have massage. That's personal preference. Um, is weight gain in psoriatic arthritis brought on by um, uh, metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome um, refers to uh, the uh, group of conditions that people suffer, often related to being a bit overweight, things like diabetes, heart disease, high cholesterol. Um, so uh, it's, it's usually more the other way around. I, I think that the, is weight gain brought on by metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome is brought on by weight gain. So you increase the weight, the um, inflammatory balance in the body changes, a lot of other things change, higher insulin levels, and um, they, that tends to promote the development of um, psoriatic arthritis. Okay, so I did include lots of pictures, so we were up to here. Um, so more pictures of nail pitting in psoriasis. Um, so inflammation in tendons occurs along with inflammation in joints in these conditions. Um, we get inflammation in the skin. Psoriatic arthritis is also a little bit different to rheumatoid in that you get inflammation in some places where it doesn't happen in rheumatoid, such as where the Achilles tendon attaches to the bone and where ligaments attach to the bone in heel pain. And now with MRI being available in the last 20 years, we can take pictures of that which really nicely show where, where exactly the inflammation is. Now um, this is a slide that does mention metabolic syndrome, so thank you for your question. Now I mentioned that um, patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis are more, likely, well, are more likely to be overweight, so they're more likely to have metabolic syndrome. That means a higher incidence of diabetes. Also abnormal liver tests because unfortunately um, associated with weight gain and higher insulin levels you start to get fat cells accumulating in the liver, so it turns from that to this. And that would often be a cause of um, abnormal liver tests that we see, and often it's a certain pattern of liver tests. So we um, look often do an ultrasound scan to have a look for this if, um, um, if um, um, the liver tests are abnormal. Now, psoriatic arthritis can also cause inflammation in other parts of the body. So for instance, it is associated with inflammatory bowel disease. 
so autoimmune inflammation in the bowels, Crohn's, um, ulcerative colitis, even inflammation in the eyes. So these are associated things that can occur um, in relation to um, this autoimmune inflammatory disease. Um, so role of blood tests. Now sadly when we do blood tests, it's not exactly a window into the soul. It, the, the blood tests are a bit like traffic lights. Sometimes they point us in one direction or another. Mostly we make up our minds um, by um, really looking at the patient, examining the patient. So um, blood tests which show us inflammation readings, they, they're a bit like thermometers in the blood of how severe things are. They give, give us a bit of a clue as to the severity if we haven't already worked it out from looking at the patient, which we should, should have done. We, we certainly do, when somebody has inflamed joints, we certainly do the rheumatoid antibodies. And, and in psoriatic arthritis, typically those rheumatoid antibodies will be negative. There's two of them that we check. Um, so psoriatic arthritis, there's no one blood test that tells us, hey, the diagnosis is psoriatic arthritis. And that sometimes it can be difficult for GPs to pick it up because they think you might have gout or something else. Um, similar, similarly, fibromyalgia, there's no blood test that tells you you have fibromyalgia. Osteoarthritis is also not a diagnosis based on blood tests. It's from looking at the person and doing appropriate scans. Um, so we need to do some good old fashioned things, um, listen, examine and do some imaging. So um, treatment, um, so always maintain your best physical and emotional health. Now um, that's a general principle in life for all of us. Um, when somebody is healthy and fit um, and has lots of muscle, then the body tends to be more resilient and bounce back from any illness. Whether you're going in to have a gallbladder out or an appendix out or a knee replacement, um, being in your best physical health um, makes a huge difference. So that means common sense dietary things, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that, exercise keeping fit um, and then you know medications that we use depending on how severe the arthritis is. So what are our goals of treatment? Our goals of treatment is to make um, life um, comfortable again, um, to reduce pain and inflammation in joints and certainly to prevent joint damage. Now not everyone um, um, is, um, will get joint damage from psoriatic arthritis um, and sometimes we're not, we can't accurately predict those that do and those that don't. So um, we have some of the people in the audience might be familiar or might be on some of these treatments. So the, um, traditionally the drugs that we use for psoriatic arthritis we just borrowed from rheumatoid. We, we know these were the drugs in the 70s and 80s that we started to use in rheumatoid and we use them in psoriatic arthritis patients and most of the time they help um, and sometimes significantly help or may put you into remission. Um, methotrexate is a drug which tends to help the psoriasis as well. Sulfasalazine and rapunamide doesn't help the psoriasis unfortunately but it's, um, it certainly can, they certainly can be helpful for the joints. And the decision of which drug to make is definitely a conversation between um, the person and the, um, the doctor. So damage. Damage can be nasty. At the end of the day you want to have hands that look like this. But this is a person who has not had very well treated arthritis and psoriatic arthritis can do a lot of damage. So instead of having nice joint spaces in amongst these knuckles and fingers, there's a whole lot of fusion. The, the bones have fused in many of those fingers and the knuckles are very damaged in wrists and other areas. When somebody turns up with lots of swollen joints, they're the people that are most likely to develop this kind of nasty damage. So lots and lots of swelling is a bad sign um, and if you have very high inflammation readings in the blood, that's a bad sign um, that you might be getting um, damage, more likely to develop damage. So um, health and fitness, diet. Now you know many people ask what can they do and um, so there's a few simple principles. Number one is um, uh, unfortunately losing weight. Um, I like eating, most people like eating and but sadly most of our diets are very high in calories and being skinny is the number one thing that makes our immune system happy. So a low calorie diet is good for our immune system and that's been shown in research time and time again. 
Um, so number one is drop your calories. Um, most people understandably want an easy cure, so you know I'll stick with my regular diet, but maybe if I just skip the tomatoes, then everything will come good. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. The Mediterranean diet, and you might have heard this in the media, is, is very, very commonly comes out as a helpful anti-inflammatory diet. And the Mediterranean diet is one that is um, wide on that, no, that didn't. Um, so um, uh, not so much red meat, lots of seafoods. Seafoods contain omega-3 fatty acids. They are very anti-inflammatory. Uh, red meats contain more omega-6 anti-inflammatory, sorry, omega-6 fatty acids and they are more pro-inflammatory. Um, the Mediterranean diet tends to be a low-carb diet, so low-carb, low-fat, low-calorie. Um, olive oil, good fats is what we're aiming for, so the seafood fats, um, avocados, lots of fresh fruit and veg. So they're the things you're aiming for with the Mediterranean diet. Um, so um, low calorie diet, so any supplements that help. So if you're really not big on seafoods or even if you are, fish oil supplements um, have been well studied. They are omega-3 fatty acids and they do good things like often reduce pain and inflammation to some degree where there's severe inflammation in the joints, they will, they will almost never totally eradicate that, but they can help pain and inflammation. Um, they often also lower cholesterol and they are also good for your heart. Um, aim for a lean body mass index, which is 20 to 25. So general, um, you know, any exercise that should be avoided, well, it, it's more that most of us don't engage in enough exercise, me included. So moderate exercise is still advised um, improving your range of movement of joints, reducing joint pain and stiffness. So people that exercise are just generally less stiff and that's always, nearly always the case with all our autoimmune inflammatory conditions. So improves flexibility, increases muscle mass and that increasing your muscle and reducing the amount of fat cells has many metabolic um, benefits, improving fatigue, sleep, energy, weight loss. When somebody walks into our office and has very inflamed joints, they certainly won't feel like exercising because any running around or weight bearing will hurt. If you've got a very swollen wrist, you can't get up and do weights. So it's our job to um, make the inflammation better so that you can get on with life. Um, so often the doctor might start with anti-inflammatory drugs and then um, depending on how severe the inflammation is, then we might use these other drugs. We um, certainly in the last... Um, since about 2002 or three, there have been this range of drugs called biologic agents. They are very expensive for Medicare to fund um, and there are certain criteria that have to be met for your rheumatologist to prescribe them. They can't be prescribed by a GP, only by a rheumatologist. You have to have tried some of these drugs for a fixed time period and you have to have lots of swollen joints to qualify for these biologics. But they certainly can um, improve um, uh, arthritis management and frequently put people into remission, although not everybody responds the same way, so that makes life difficult for you guys. Um, so the, the first biological drugs were the TNF inhibitors, so drugs like Enbro, Humira, Simzia and Fixamab Symphony might be familiar to you. And then we've had an, uh, another one, Stellara, and then more recently Cosentix and Tolt. Um, so I know there are some lifestyle questions there, but I just wanted to show you you know, psoriasis can, can be such a horrendous disease and these slides are not meant to offend but just to show you that really it's the biologic drugs, they're the drugs that make people go from this to this, you know, to give you substantial significant improvement, usually in the skin and um, as well as in the joints. So um, lots of dietary questions coming through. If vegan, will flaxseed oil be good? So um, yes, so flaxseed is a plant-based omega-3 um, and yes, that can be beneficial. Um, you know, when we, as doctors, we try and talk about what's proven and not proven so that you know what's just somebody's opinion versus what we would call fact. So to call it fact, you'd have to say that there's um, some evidence to back up. So we know a lot about fish oil because it's really been well, pretty well studied. Now flaxseed oil, I don't believe has been as well studied. Unfortunately, it does take a whole lot of money to fund large studies and work out how much effect it has. Um, but certainly if you're vegan, I do we do recommend flaxseed oil 
um, for patients. It may not be as well absorbed or as effective as fish oils, though, unfortunately. Um, so do certain people often ask, do certain foods cause or aggravate arthritis? So that's rarely the case. If you have gout, that's a different kettle of fish, and certain things like shellfish and alcohol can certainly aggravate gout. But we don't. And but sometimes people do tell us that certain foods might make their arthritis worse, and that's um, something that uh, is probably happening that it's very hard to recognise and study. In general, um, you know, the healthy diet, low calorie diet, is what. Um, helps arthritis. And in fact, I mentioned that overweight people are more likely to develop psoriatic arthritis. Sometimes when patients have been, people have been very, very overweight and undergone um, the more significant intervention of having stomach surgery, um, they actually their psoriasis disappears. So just the effect of losing 30 or 40 kilos in a six or nine month period, the um, psoriasis can be almost gone. So that's a dramatic example of how without drugs, um, lifestyle intervention can make a big difference. So um, certain foods can help arthritis and we talked about um, omega-3 being good, oily fish two or three times a week. is generally Eating the, um, the real deal, the fresh fish is a bit better than taking capsules but if you don't eat any fish then capsules at least is something. Um, now, can swimming be beneficial while in an inflamed state? Definitely, because um, swimming in terms of exercise, it's a form of exercise which is very, very good for you, very effective at building up health and fitness and muscle, and in, it's in a non-weight bearing environment, and people often uh, really enjoy the massage effect of the water, so swimming is excellent. Unfortunately, it's a bit more um, time consuming. Um, and. Um, there's a question on hemp seed, has omega-3 and omega-6, does this fit into category of not enough research? Um, yes, and I have, ha I have heard some good medic um, research, uh, I have heard some great presentations on sort of marijuana or hemp in the last couple of years and, um, and there are certain aspects which um, um, may be beneficial but it really needs to be delivered. Um, you, you need to absolutely know the source of and it needs to be regulated and manufactured in a way that you really know the dose um, and it, it, it's, it, it's, a con um, it, it's been, uh, um, it's not been studied inflammatory arthritis, I can tell you that. So we really don't know what effect it has on um, on inflammation, but we we do know that it has some can have some quite bad effects on the brain. So one has to be um, careful. Now, turmeric and curcumin. Some questions on that. So, giving you the boring answer of we don't know. Um, with curcumin, there's not a whole lot of research. It takes a lot of money, a lot of big bucks to fund a, you know significant research that um, tells you yes or no it's good. Um, patients often try it, I understand that, um, and because often we're not uh, good at totally getting rid of their arthritis and pain, so you'll try other things. Um, so the thing I'd say about that is taking pure turmeric, great. Um, you know what you're taking. When you buy something off the shelf in a um, health food shop or chemist, th those types of um, pills are not very well regulated, so what they say is in there is not always what's in there. And that aspect, unfortunately, has been documented that occasionally chemists go to the shelves, grab a whole lot of bottles, take them back to the lab and analyse what the ingredients are and what they say is in there is always what's in there. So I would be wary myself of spending $50 on turmeric when you can go and buy a bucket load from the supermarket for a lot less. Um, so it, again, this might be a bit of a shortcut sometimes where if people find it difficult to make lifestyle changes you often look for what can I do that will quickly change my situation and at the moment we can't say that turmeric is going to be the answer and usually unfortunately there's no one thing that's going to be the answer. Oops. Um, so um, is chondroitin and glucosamine supplement beneficial? That's been a little bit studied in osteoarthritis and unfortunately not been found to be that effective at reducing um, uh, osteoarthritis some may help the pain, so certainly give it a shot for the pain, um, but unfortunately we, there's really no evidence that it, um, um, uh, that it does um, actually reduce the rate of cartilage loss. And thank you for that comment about hemp seed being available in supermarkets. I'll have to improve my research and knowledge on that. Um, so. 
um, what else have I got? So omega-3, um, people often ask about nightshade foods. Again, really not studied. You, you know, when somebody says, look, this might help or that might help, it'd be nice to have some sort of theory behind why they might make a difference. Do they really make a difference to inflammation? And when, when um, studies have been done on various diets and they've looked at patient populations with various diets, it's really that Mediterranean diet, low calorie, low fat, low carb, um, high in fish oils, that tends to make the biggest difference, not things like the nightshade. So that's a common one I'm asked. Dairy products are certainly not bad for you. Um, use in moderation and if you're lactose intolerant, that might be one of the reasons why they upset your tummy. Um, meat and meat products are not inherently bad. We do get a lot of protein and iron from red meat. They're just important, um, maybe not to overdo it, um, but use in moderation. So exercises. Um, everything that includes a combination of um, aerobic and strength building, so um, combinations of things are really good. Tai Chi is very helpful um, as a gentle starting point for people with exercise, people that are quite debilitated or by arthritis or as we're getting older, it's a good place to start. Um, so how common are comorbidity diagnoses such as fibromyalgia? So um, fibromyalgia is uh, um, sensitivity and pain in a lot of soft tissue areas, not necessarily related to um, joint or muscle damage, and you, well, definitely not related to joint and muscle damage. And um, that um, is more common when, if you have something like rheumatoid or lupus and psoriatic arthritis as well, that you're more likely to have fibromyalgia, and especially so um, in women. Um, Shingles vaccination. So um, now, shingles vaccination, the current shingles vaccine is um, a live vaccine. And so if you're on immune suppressive drugs, um, which most of the things that I mentioned are those drug therapies are, uh, you need to discuss that with your rheumatologist. Um, certainly with the biologics, we don't allow um, the, the current shingles vaccine. There will be, which is a live vaccine, there will be another um, vaccine um, in the hopefully the next few years that's not a live vaccine and will hopefully be more effective than the current vaccine. Uh, what are we worried about? What would happen? Um, we worry about if we give you a live vaccine that you can actually develop chicken pox or shingles um, from that, so um, which can make you very sick, obviously. So that's what we're most worried about by giving people live vaccines when they're immune suppressed. Um, what questions did I miss? So I didn't spend a lot of time going into drug therapies, but if there are some questions of that, someone has asked, is Enbrel safe to use long term? Now we've had um, Enbrel available as a drug, that's one of the first biologics TNF inhibitors um, available in 2001 and 2002 overseas. For rheumatoid arthritis, it's been become available for all psoriatic arthritis, it's um, available for psoriasis and um, it, um, is it safe to use long term? Um, most of the time, yes. Um, and when I say most of the time, if it's effective and continues to be effective long term, um, mostly if you do get side effects, you'll know about it. It doesn't tend to do things like upset your tummy or your, or your liver or affect your blood counts or kidneys. Um, there are a few rare side effects that occur, skin rashes um, and other things, but you'll know about it if you develop them and they tend to happen in less than 1% of people. We worry about infections, so if you're somebody that's prone to infections, if you're a smoker, if you're very overweight, diabetes, have a lot of chest infections or lung disease, then you're not going to be the person that we would put on Enbro. Um, so if someone is having recurrent severe, serious infections, then, then we would stop um, that kind of therapy. Um, and, but the good thing is with these biologics, we actually now have had a quite a long history of use because they have been available for over 15 years. So we're talking about millions of people worldwide that have been on these agents. Um, okay, next question. Effects of methotrexate on fertility long term. So um, the, uh, if you're a female and you're wanting to get pregnant, um, the short answer is you come off methotrexate. If you're offered for three months, it is clearly out of your system. It's really actually mostly out of the system at four to six weeks, but we just use three months to be absolutely certain. If you fall pregnant on methotrexate, it certainly can harm the baby, so we avoid that. Um, and um, 
So, but it doesn't impair your long-term fertility. What does impair long-term fertility is having severe disease. So we know that when somebody is very sick with lupus or rheumatoid, um, that, uh, that the, um, you're less successful at becoming pregnant and maintaining the pregnancy and having um, a really healthy baby. So the disease um, can be quite nasty, have a nasty effect on the outcome for mother and baby. Um, it doesn't seem to impede fertility in men. Um, does prednisolone have an impact on psoriasis? So um, yes, it does. So it makes psoriasis melt away very quickly. Um, that's, that is um, oral prednisolone, taking it in tablet form. But unfortunately, when you stop the prednisolone, um, the psoriasis flares terribly. So the short answer is it's not, uh, prednisolone tablets is not the recommended treatment at all for psoriasis. And we, there, for the similar reasons, we try and avoid it in psoriatic arthritis, um, especially if someone has severe skin disease. If somebody has milder psoriasis and has terribly inflamed joints, then yes, there are times where we will use a bit of oral prednisolone to get people feeling better quickly. But we, it's certainly not a good drug to rely on um, long term. Um, we do use topical prednisolone, topical steroids, of course, for skin psoriasis. Um, so can PSA onset be sudden or progressive over time? Um, it can be a bit of both. Some people certainly do tell us that it can, has come on quite quickly. Most of the time, it, it sort of gradually builds up. And uh, I guess um, humanly, sometimes we wish it would go away and we don't rush to a doctor straight away. Or sometimes you do go to a doctor and you feel like you've been fobbed off and told, oh, it's nothing, don't worry, your bloods are normal, it'll go away. So um, it is quite common with psoriatic arthritis that people have had it for a few months or maybe even a couple of years of joint pain and stiffness and they might not really realise how long they've had it until we give them a drug that makes them better and then they realise actually what feeling normal seems um, is like. So um, question, would there be any reason to change from methotrexate to Enbrel? Um, the reason would be if your disease is not responding to methotrexate, if you're developing joint damage, um, if you have lots of swollen joints and high inflammation in your blood and you've used methotrexate in combination with one of the other drugs, then you would be, might be a candidate for something like Enbrel or one of the other biologics and um, that would be something to discuss with your rheumatologist. Um, does guttate psoriasis occur even if you've had psoriasis for years? Guttate is a form of psoriasis that's quite spotty, um, not so common, can occur after certain infections, strep infection. Um, so I'd strictly I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm guessing possibly if you have psoriasis, but, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, what resources would you recommend to use for patients with psoriatic arthritis? So um, literature resources. So if you Google um, the website of this organisation, um, which used to be called Arthritis Victoria, um, now it's Musculoskeletal Health um, Victoria, Australia, then they will usually have some written resources and uh, the references attached to those two or three page um, information documents might also be of value to you. You can do things like look at the uh, American um, websites as well um, and um, the UK websites also. Um, so they would be some reputable sources um, to start off with. Um, Arthritis Australia, yeah. So um, is there much evidence for light therapy? So uh, UV therapy is commonly used for psoriasis and certainly does have a significant impact, um, yes. So does it help the joints? No, but it can help the skin. Does psoriatic arthritis burn out um, like an OA? Well, an OA doesn't really burn out. And psoriatic arthritis, I think the answer there is that sometimes it can go into remission um, and you can be off treatment and it might stay away for a while. A while might mean a few months or a few years. I've certainly had patients go off therapy and then come back with more swollen joints. Um, and the people that we would take off therapy are the ones that don't have any joint damage and don't have severe disease. So, um, or sometimes people obviously just decide to come off treatment to see if they can cope without it and see what's going on in their body and that's, uh, I can understand that that would be the case and sometimes it's an okay thing to do. 
So, um, but, uh, so I would say that not necessarily burnout because you can be older and develop psoriatic arthritis, but it more that it can wax and wane. So it can be up and down in waves at times, come and go, um, but can certainly have long periods of remission. Um, massage doesn't hurt or harm um, and it's up to you and it often makes people feel a bit better, but it just shouldn't take the place of exercise. Um, oh, very hard question. Why do biologics stop working? Um, we, yeah, we don't. We, we just some. We just some of it. We just don't know. Um, there are um, in groups of patients. So sometimes uh, factors such as intermittent use of drugs. So if um, people uh, stop and start their treatments a lot. Um, so if you're off it for a few months and then you go back on it when you're in lots of pain. That's not a good thing and that does make your body a bit resistant to the drug, so we know that definitely isn't good. Um, part of it might be that your body makes antibodies to the drug. Um, sometimes we suggest using methotrexate together with the biologic because that might make it more likely that, you, that the biologic doesn't stop working over time. Um, but I, yeah, I know a common one is that people do understandably stop and start their drugs, they just don't take it as regularly as is recommended and that does unfortunately increase the chance of your biologic not working. Are there any new treatments coming for PSA? Yes, there's lots of research. Um, the pharmaceutical companies do put a lot of money into that research. Um, so the biologics encompass a whole group of drugs, um, different families of drugs and I can definitely tell you there are more in the pipeline coming for both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And Australia's Medicare system is overall pretty good at, um, um, at allowing those drugs to be available for people um, provided you um, meet the required restrictions, um, required criteria I should say. Uh, so question, um, sorry I joined the webinar late, just wondering at what age PSA usually starts. Usually, uh, most common age is 40s and 50s actually, so often after you've had psoriasis for 10 years, um, most people develop psoriatic arthritis by six times. So thanks very much for your questions, that makes life more interesting. Um, someone earlier on when I didn't want to just talk about osteoarthritis the whole time, asked about um, what can you do to prevent osteoarthritis. So um, the, yeah, the short answer is unfortunately there are no proven treatments that help prevent cartilage wear and tear. We know that keeping your body weight down, having strong muscles helps to maintain the joint better, maybe slows down the rate of loss, but most of us sort of gradually lose cartilage over time. Um, and to date, nothing proven. The second something is proven, it'll be big news, it'll be on the media and news telecast, so everyone will know about it. So when you read products over the counter that say helps arthritis, they're usually meaning might help pain, um, but does it actually prevent the osteoarthritis? No, nothing proven. So thank you very much for asking lots of questions. So I'll just hang about yeah. for... Yeah, and I'll come back on there, Marie, as well, and just say what a stellar job you've done answering all those questions. It was fabulous to have so many questions coming through, but you certainly did a great job. Now, I'm not sure if I'm mistaken. I think there was one question that I noticed. I don't know if you, you answered it. Um, a question about is it common to be on methotrexate and Enbrel at the same time? Did you, did you get... Yes, okay. Sorry, yes. That, Sorry I didn't answer that. Yes, you know, that's, I think that's the only one. So you did an amazing job to, uh, to cover all those questions. Um, so look, just if anyone has got any last minute questions, please type them in now. We'll be finishing in just a moment. Uh, looks like through, from the messages coming through that people have found the webinar very informative and um, uh, that was just fabulous, Marie, to really respond to, to all the different uh, questions that people had. Um, in relation to managing their conditions and so on. So um, look, thanks everyone. Uh, the exit survey that gives us a bit of feedback about our survey and always just helps us to improve should be coming up on your screen now or shortly. Um, so if you could fill that in, we would be very grateful. Uh, Marie, thank you very much again for your uh, giving of your time and your expertise to present the webinar tonight. I'd like to thank everyone for joining. 
um, and also remind you that our next webinar will be coming up in May. So look at our website and I should also say there is quite extensive information on our Musculoskeletal Australia website about psoriatic arthritis and, and various other conditions. So please go to our, our website www.msk.org.au and you'll find uh, lots of great information there. So on that note, I'd like to thank you, Marie, and thank everyone for joining, and I wish you good night. Good night.